the Fredonian Rebellion. Started out whenever Hayden Edwards was given an impresario contract by the Mexican government to settle 800 families near Nacogdoches. When he attempted to start his colony, there were people living in the land that he was supposed to sell as part of his land grant. These people were called the Old Settlers. They'd been living in East Texas for a while. So the Mexican government had to make a ruling on who got to stay there and who really owned that property. So the Mexican government said that Hayden Edwards had to respect the property rights of anyone who had a title or a deed to their land and could legally dispute that the land belonged to them with paperwork. So this, this would be their land titles that were given to them by the Spanish or the Mexican government before 1825. Hayden Edwards did not like this ruling, so he is going to declare that most of the old settlers' land titles were fake, which really, they weren't all fake. Some of them were. Some of them weren't. And he charged extra fees for those who had already purchased their land. So those people that had land titles for land that was in his colony, he's just going to put them in his colony and ask them to pay an impresario fee. So this is going to make the old settlers really angry and distrusting of the Edwards brothers and those associated with them. Hayden Edwards then held an election that was rigged for his son-in-law. What happens after he says that all these people are just a bunch of liars with their paperwork? And then whenever he rigs an election to pretty much set the person he wants in leadership the old settlers reported Edwards' activities to the Mexican government, and the government had the settlers hold a new election. So they're going to fix it by making sure that a new election can happen so that whoever is elected will be the actual person that was elected. And then they cancel Hayden Edwards' land contract so he can no longer be an impresario. There are some people in the area that supported Edwards, though. So Hayden Edwards' supporters rallied behind him and behind his brother, Benjamin. And they're going to declare the area of that colony independent of Mexican government. So that means they're going to take that area that was supposed to be Hayden Edwards' colony. And they say, this is independent from the Mexican government. And now we're going to be our own country. They call it the Republic of Fredonia. That's why this is called the Fredonian Rebellion. The surrounding colonies supported the Mexican government's decision, though. So we are not with them. We do not agree with declaring independence against Mexico. The Mexican government sent troops, and Stephen F. Austin sent his own colony's militia. So a militia is a volunteer army that's made up of your citizens in your colony or your area, your community, so that they can... Um, protect against invaders. So they go, put down the rebellion, and the rebels are going to run away from the Republic of Fredonia. The rebellion failed. The Mir Eteran Report of 1828. The Fredonian Rebellion worried Mexico. People in the U.S. had heard about the rebellion, and Mexico was afraid that Americans would send a new round of filibusters to go stir up a revolution to help settlers rebel against the Mexican government. Mexico had also turned down several offers from the United States to buy Texas from Mexico. John Quincy Adams offered $1 million for Texas in 1826. Then Andrew Jackson turns right around, so these are both presidents of the U.S., who offered $4 million in 1830. So four years later, let's try again. And Mexico both times is going to say no. This is going to lead to Mexico's increased concern for the amount of Americans or Anglos, since they're no longer Americans, so Anglo-Mexican citizens living in Texas. The point of the Miri Tehran's inspection was to check to see if Anglo colonization was fulfilling its original purpose, which was to create a buffer zone. But based on the different recommendations that he makes, there's also going to be an unofficial reason 
for his reports. So yes, he goes and he checks on the native population to see if there is a separation between the Mexican settlements and the native populations. And he also goes and checks the Louisiana border to see if there's any threat of America invading because they needed that buffer there. They needed a clear line, a clear boundary between Mexico and the United States. So the unofficial reason for his report was to get a tally on the Anglo population in Texas and to see if they were behaving as loyal Mexican citizens. So they promised to become Catholic. Did they become Catholic? And are they following our rules? Are they following our traditions? What are they doing? And he found that the Anglo population outnumbered the Tejano population 10 to 1. So he is going to make some recommendations based on his findings. He says, let's increase trade between Texas and Mexico. And what that is going to do is anytime that you build trade relationships, it builds dependency. So that means he wants to get Texas to depend on Mexico instead of trading with the United States. And they are dependent on the United States, not their country that they have sworn to be loyal to. He says, station more troops in Texas. And this is to monitor what they're doing. Are they behaving like Mexican citizens? He also says decrease immigration rates from the United States to Texas. He says there's just too many people that are flooding into Texas from the United States. And you can understand why. We went over the reasons why they moved to Texas. They want a fresh start. So it looks really nice on the other side of that border to move from the United States into Mexico into Texas at that time. And let's encourage Mexican citizens to move into Texas. So the law of April 6th, 1830. This is the direct response to Mary Tehran's recommendations. And the law is going to be a mandate, make an immediate stop to immigration from the U.S. to Texas. So instead of just slowing it down a little bit, it's going to stop it completely. So no longer will people that are living in Texas or people that are living in the United States be able to move back and forth, that movement will be stopped. And then also, slavery would not be tolerated in Texas. So Mary Tehran also noticed that a lot of these Texans that came from the United States brought slavery with them. If Mexico had that rule that said there was no slavery, then in order to make sure that that happens, it has to be monitored. That means they have to actively enforce that law. Or these Americans... They just brought slaves in anyway. Taxes on imports from the United States. So this is going to be a big deal for these Texans. They're going to hate this because it's a tax. Taxes on imports will be called customs duties. So these customs duties are going to encourage the Texans to buy goods from Mexico because Mexico wants to build a trade relationship. This is usually how that happens. This is not going to make these Anglos very happy because they're buying everything from what they know. And what they know is America because that's where they came from. So the reason why Mexico wants to do this, they have a good reason. So I see both sides and um, more taxes is not good for people that are trying to start out and start a new life. But also you got to take it from Mexico's perspective too. And all of the, the money that goes into buying the different products that were from the United States, that could have been going into the Mexican economy. And if these people were part of Mexico, then they should want to build the Mexican economy. So I see their part on that too. So the next thing we look at is that the law is going to upset not just Anglos, but it also upsets the Tejanos in Texas because they feared for the economy. So again, remember why Americans left the U.S. They know fear about the economy and fear is catching. Impresario contracts were suspended. So that's the next thing that's going to happen. If you can't bring people into Texas, then you can't build a colony. So all of those contracts for new impresarios where they had been given a land grant, those are no longer going to even exist because they're not going to want those people to bring in anyone from the United States. So the only people that are going to be an exception will be Stephen F. Austin and Green DeWitt. And really for them, it's because their contracts were already active and they had already planned for people to be moving in. 
Stephen F. Austin was shook by this law. He does encourage the colonists, though, to follow the law and to work with the Mexican government. He is very diplomatic in most of the moves that he makes whenever all this is happening. And this is typical diplomatic type of Stephen F. Austin decision. Work with the government and then they'll work with you. All right, so the Tejano leaders who oppose this law are going to be men like Juan Erasmo Seguin, Jose Antonio Navarro, and Francisco Ruiz discuss all of the benefits of having Americans immigrate to Texas. All right, this is a copy of the law of April 6th. This one document, this one piece of paper, is going to upset these Texans to a tipping point. The conflicts of Anahuac. There's a guy named Juan Davis Bradburn who was placed in charge of the Mexican government. He fought in the Mexican Revolution against Spain, and he wasn't actually from Mexico to begin with, but he's given a position in the Mexican government because of his experience in the military. And he's going to be in charge of monitoring the customs duties for the imports and immigration from the United States. So he was in charge of enforcing the law of April 6, 1830 directly. And this is problem number one. So he stationed his men at a knot close to Galveston Bay, and he clashed with Francisco Madero, who was part of the Texas government. And uh, Madero was in charge of issuing land titles to immigrants who arrived before 1830. So there's still some people that are trickling in. They had paid their money already. They just had to get there and get there to Texas and then get their paperwork done so that they could show that they legally owned their land. Now, Juan Davis Bradburn arrested him because he felt that Madero was overstepping and breaking Mexican laws by allowing more people to come to Texas and giving them paperwork to own land in Texas. And this upset a lot of these Texans. Uh, more customs officials showed up and, the ch and then changed the rules so that the customs duties had to be paid at a knock. So really what Bradburn's doing is he's moving everything to where he wants to be because he doesn't want to roam around anywhere. He wants to be in one spot, take care of everything in one place. And this is going to cause really great frustration because the rules changed and made it nearly impossible for the people to fulfill. They have to go get paperwork in a place called Brazoria, and they have to go pay um, their fees, their import taxes, those customs duties in Anahuac. And we're living in a day and age where the transportation is not going to be very fast. So these people have farms they have to tend to. You can't leave those things alone for very long. So Stephen F. Austin files a complaint with Juan Davis Bradburn about all the rules being changed and being pretty much impossible to fulfill. And Juan Davis Bradburn does pretty much nothing. The Texians will be pushed over the edge when Bradburn arrests William B. Travis and Patrick Jack. Now, they were being kind of troublemakers. They were making false reports about an invasion from Louisiana, and kind of pestered Juan Davis Bradburn. The Turtle Bayou Resolutions. William Jack, Patrick Jack's brother, organized a mob to orchestrate a jailbreak to get Patrick Jack and William B. Travis out of jail. So settlers from Manawak, Brazoria, and Liberty protested for the release of Patrick Jack and William B. Travis when 150 plus people marched on Bradburn at the Fort of Anauk. So, Bradburn agrees to release the prisoners if the protesters will leave. So he says, just get all these people out of here and I'll release them. So most of the protesters are going to leave, but a few stayed behind. I think they were waiting to see if Bradburn was going to do what he said he was going to do. So Bradburn refused to let Travis and Jack out of jail. So the mob withdrew to Turtle Bayou, and they sent a few men to retrieve cannons from Brasoria. At Turtle Bayou, the men are going to write a resolution, which is a statement of the group's opinions, and they had a lot of opinions. But it boiled down to a few main things that they wanted the Mexican government to know, not just about what happened, but also what was probably about to happen, and that was they were going to perform a jailbreak by force. So they're saying to the Mexican government, we did not and we are not going to start a rebellion. 
We are simply defending our rights. And by the way, we also want to state that we support General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana and the Mexican Civil War between him and President Anastasio Bustamante. The Battle of Velasco, this word here. That is the word colonel, even though it looks like colonel. It's a colonel. It's a ranking in the military. Colonel Jose de los Pedros was sent from Nacogdoches to Anak to clean up the mess that Bradburn made. He is going to blame Bradburn. He's the reason why all this is happening. Let's fix it. And he sees the one main thing that the people want at the time, and in order to appease them, he is going to do that one thing, and that is release Travis and Jack from jail. So set them free, let them loose, and then we can solve all the other problems when everybody's not so angry. Those who had gone to retrieve the cannons from Brazoria had no clue the issues at Anawak had been resolved and that there was no more need for a jailbreak. So June 26, 1832, the Texians reached Velasco at the mouth of the Brazos River, where the Mexican commander in the area, Colonel Domingo Urteca, would not let the armed men pass. So the Texians are going to attempt to fight their way through, and after three days of battling it out, the Mexican troops ran out of ammunition, and the Texans accepted the Mexican troops' surrender. Now they move Onward towards Anahuac to find that Travis and Jack had already been released from jail. Many Mexican troops at this point left Texas to return to Mexico. The Convention of 1832. Stephen F. Austin made it clear that the Texans were pro-Santa Ana. He met with one of Santa Ana's colonels and supporters named Jose Antonio Mexia. Now, Mexia sent word to Santa Ana that he had talked with the Texans, and Santa Ana had the support of Texas. And in 1832, Santa Ana won his war and was elected as president of Mexico in 1833. Texans were excited about this new opportunity with this new leadership because they felt like they could be involved in their new government, and they wanted to be involved with something specific called reform, which is changes in the government's policies and in the government's law. Specifically, they wanted to make changes to the law of April 6, 1830. Now, delegates, which are representatives from the colonies and communities called districts, met at San Felipe de Austin, this is the capital of Austin's colony, to discuss what reforms were most important to the majority. So they decided on these four things. Lift the ban on immigration from the United States. Next, separate Texas from Coquila to give Texas a stronger control over local laws. So they wanted to be their own separate state so they could have a little bit more freedom to make their own rules. Removal of custom duties for three years. And then also land grants for public schools because they didn't have public schools. They were having to send their kids to school in the U.S. or they were having to try to find a private school to put them in and pay money for that. San Antonio refused to participate. The re resolutions never got presented. Stephen F. Austin is going to try to figure out why did San Antonio not get involved? Why didn't they want to be a part of this? Why don't they want to be active in reform? And he realizes that every Texan or Texian is going to have to be able to participate in these reforms to succeed. So to be able to put their ideas in place. And so he realizes that means Anglos and Tejanos need to work together because they weren't. We saw, you know, back whenever we were looking at the opinions of things that the Anglos and the Tejanos, they have similar opinions at this point. So they need to work together. So Stephen F. Austin uses his diplomatic skills to try to gain support from those leaders in San Antonio, that big Tejano community. But the Texians grow impatient. And while he's trying to gain support, they go ahead and call another convention in San Felipe de Austin without him. They meet in his own capital and they don't even invite him. So on April 1st, 1833, Without Stephen F. Austin, they meet to go back over their ideas and see, do we still have the same opinion? Some of those leaders that were meeting there were William H. Wharton again, and also Sam Houston arrives on the scene. 
they call for action and they narrow down their resolution. So their, their main opinions that they have to one legalize immigration from the United States. They're not going to budge on that and then create a separate Texan state apart from Coahuila. They still want to be a separate state so they can make more of their own rules. The convention selected Stephen F. Austin, Juan Erasmo Seguin, and James B. Miller to present the resolutions. Austin was the only one that could go, though, because it was going to be three months just to get to Mexico City. So they don't know how long they're going to be gone. So Austin is going to take the resolutions by himself. He'll start out on his way April 22nd, 1833. Austin's arrest. When Austin entered Mexico City, things were a bit chaotic. Santa Ana was not in the city, and the people were experiencing a cholera outbreak or pandemic, you could call it. So we kind of feel some of the chaos that was taking place at that time in history. Stephen F. Austin arrives in Mexico City. He walks into the middle of a pandemic. So Austin had to meet with the vice president, Valentin Gomez Farias, who was overrun with other government issues that took priority over those opinions of the Texians that they made up in the resolution. So Austin is going to be forced to wait nearly two months just to see this guy. So he waits till September 1833 just to talk with the vice president. And when Austin was able to speak with Farias, he is going to ask the vice president to review all of the resolutions. And then he mentions that Texas may go ahead and start organizing a state government even without government approval because planning isn't against the law. Planning is, is good organization. So they would not put their plans into place until the government approved it, but they wanted to go ahead and get a jump on the planning. So Farias thought Austin was threatening his authority and he ended the, um, the meeting right then and there. He was offended. So Austin then had to wait again after waiting another month. Austin wrote to San Antonio and he told them to begin organizing a local government. He got impatient because he was frustrated. He's sitting there having to wait. So he writes the letter and sends it to San Antonio. In November, remember he set out in April. So in November, Austin was finally able to meet with Santa Ana in which Santa Ana agreed to the resolutions from the convention of 1833, or at least some of them, the two that he's going to say, yes, let's go ahead and I'll let you do that. He's going to lift the ban on immigration from the United States. So score, they got something that they wanted. Also, he's not going to take away the taxes for three years, but he is going to lower the import taxes as a compromise. But there's one thing that he does not budge on, and that is he is going to refuse to allow Texas to separate from Coahuila. Now, this is, I think, a, a sound decision on Santa Ana's part because he took the report, Mary Tehran's report. He said that these Texans are not acting like Mexican citizens. Coahuila, they act like Mexican citizens. So in order to bridge the gap, keep Coahuila and Tejas together. But I also understand the point of view from the Texas side of things. They really want to be able to make their own laws. Austin left Mexico City in December with good news to take back to the Texans. So he reached Sotillo and Coahuila. That is the capital of Coahuila at the time. He reaches Sotillo in January. And he's going to be arrested because he wrote the letter to the local government in San Antonio that said, hey, let's go ahead and start planning a government. Santa Ana has told them no. So if it looks like he's trying to go ahead and stir that up, go ahead and plan it, then it makes it look like he's not going to do what Santa Ana has said. So Austin left Mexico City in December. He gets arrested and then he is going to be escorted by armed guards back to Mexico City and held there for trial until December 25th in 1834. Remember how long he's been here? He started out April 1833. He's not going to be allowed to return to Texas until July 1835. And the whole ordeal 
really just alarmed these Texans. Like, what did he do? And when are we going to see him again? They hadn't heard from him. They didn't know if he was alive or dead. And he was in prison. Mexico tightened control. 1834, Santa Ana declared that Mexico was not ready to be a republic, and he created something called a centralist government. Now, centralist government means that all the power was given to the federal government and the states didn't have any power. So Texas wanting to have that state power to make their own rules, it didn't even mean anything now because really there is no power in the states for them to make their own rules. So in making Mexico a centralist government, Santa Ana abolished the Constitution of 1824. So their rights that were listed there are gone. Those things that felt like home, like federalism from the American Constitution is now gone. So some Texians stirred up some trouble. This guy named Andrew Briscoe, he's going to kind of play a prank on some of these customs officers. And William B. Travis is just going to jump on board with that. No pun intended. So the Mexican government sent General Martin Perfecto de Cos to occupy San Antonio. That means to stay there and make sure that people don't get out of line. And he's going to travel to Anahuac again, and he is going to issue arrest for William B. Travis and Lorenzo de Zavala. So you haven't heard Lorenzo de Zavala in a little while. So he was one of those impresarios. Remember, he was the one that was a revolutionary at heart. So he worked in the Mexican government until Santa Ana abolished the Constitution. So as soon as Santa Ana abolished the Constitution, he quit. He said, I resign. I don't want any part in this. And then he starts to go stir up a revolution because that's in his nature. He's going to fight for his rights and the rights of others. Right from the moment whenever these citizens found out that Santa Ana had abolished the Constitution, there will be two parties to form. One party is the war party, and they wanted immediate independence from Mexico. The other party was the peace party. They wanted to separate from Coahuila but remain under Mexican authority. Even after the abolition of the Constitution of 1824, they still would wanted to stay with Mexico to be able to keep the peace. But they're saying, well, let's just separate from Coahuila still. Maybe there will be a chance that we'll get to make our own rules. That's gone now. That chance is over. So before his arrest, Stephen F. Austin wanted to find peaceful solutions. So remember, he wanted to be a diplomat. Um, he wanted to find the way to talk through it. So he would have been in the peace party. He wanted to make good reforms. But after his arrest and the whole ordeal with him in Mexico City, this is going to change his opinion. And I kind of feel like he would be feeling lucky just to make it out there without having contracted cholera and dying. But his opinion, once he gets home and he knows he's he's still alive and he has work he can do, it's going to be to be part of the war party. Immediate independence from Mexico. This is Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. 